What is a feast to a poor prisoner? Is it a heaping bowl of gruel? Is it a lobster straight from the sea? Or is it bread and water? Just enough to get you through the night. Prisons in the 18th century are one of the most grueling subjects we can study. I want a victory for this poor prisoner. We are going to make him a feast. I want to understand the real history of the 18th and early 19th century. And if we want to understand society in that time period, we have to know what they did with people who broke the rules. That is crime and punishment. What happens in the 18th and early 19th century is completely different than what happens today. Almost diametrically opposed to what we do today. Today, we do a lot of incarcerating people. We put them in prison for periods of time to punish them and to rehabilitate them. But that does not happen generally in the 18th century. People are punished for breaking the rules by fining them. They might whip them. They might put them in a pillory, you know, in the stocks. They might transport someone, send them to a whole nother place. Maybe America in the 18th century and in the 19th century to Australia. And they would also just plain execute them. That idea of rehabilitating somebody doesn't exist until we get to about 1800 and then there is a complete sea change. What does prison look like? Who is in prison in the 18th century? Well, people awaiting trial. Sometimes witnesses have to be held in prison in the 18th century. We have debtors being held in prison and there's some fascinating studies about what's happening with debtors in the 18th century. They also have workhouses. Poor people who are destitute, they are put into a prison-like situation. And related to this, we have prisoners of war. How they treat prisoners of war in the 18th century starts to bleed into and change the way they treat regular civilian prisoners also. A perfect example of this is what happens with prisoners of war during the American Revolution. The British started to hold American POWs in hulks or decommissioned ships. They started to use this idea a few decades later in Great Britain and they had prison hulks for regular civilian prisoners. They did this because they needed prisons quickly. They couldn't transport people away to North America anymore. It takes a long time to build a prison. And so they had these old ships. They could turn them into an instant prison. They were very hard to escape from and they held people very well. There are two main drivers of this change from how we're punishing prisoners in this late 18th century time period. And one of those is really kind of driven by Quakers, especially in Pennsylvania. They had an idea that maybe this corporal punishment, the idea of executing prisoners or deporting prisoners, that they didn't think worked very well. They had the idea that they could rehabilitate prisoners, that they could punish them in a prison setting, maybe giving them very small quantities of food, maybe holding them in solitary confinement, that this would change their idea and make them into better people. And also in Great Britain, we have this problem of them no longer being able to deport or export their prisoners. And so they had to have a different way of dealing with them. So they started to hold them for longer terms in the prison ships and in prisons that they built. But how are these prisoners treated? How are they fed? That's what we're looking for here. What are prisoners eating? That can be very, very different in so many different settings. Earlier on in the 18th century, before we get to the idea of the punishment concept and we're just holding people in prison, well, most people are held in county jails awaiting their trial. And if that's happening, then they're fed with basically whatever they can afford. Most people come in with a little bit of money and the jailers are feeding them saying, well, you know, we're not gonna give you a ration. You're gonna have to pay for your own food. So if you were rich in prison, you could eat as much as you want. And if you were poor, you might not have anything. Maybe a little bit of charity would come in and they would feed prisoners who didn't have any way of feeding themselves. It is very ad hoc. It's very, very changeable 
in that early 18th century context. As we move on and we're gonna put people in prison as a punishment, then food starts to change a lot and people can't buy themselves anything they want. The rules change and they say, no, you have to deal with just the prison ration that you're given. Sometimes there's some flexibility there. There's a certain prisons where each prisoner is given a ration of bread, maybe even something like hardtack, and then one penny a day. And they can spend that penny on, well, whatever meat or other kind of food that they want for that particular day. And in some prisons, they had a sutler, a single person who was in charge of that kind of meat or other kinds of foodstuffs. And that was very highly regulated so that the prisoners weren't cheated. They created this system because earlier on in the 18th century, jailers were known to steal whatever they could from the people under their care. They were in charge of their food and so they could charge as high a price as they like. Food is part of the punishment. At times, nothing but bread and water. That is the ration and probably not that much bread. In fact, there is a study that was done. They were experimenting on the prisoners in Great Britain in the 1820s, and they said, these prisoners are getting too much food. Let's keep lowering and lowering the ration until we see what they can survive upon. And it was a couple of years into that experiment and they had to call it off. Too many people were dying. And I guess they decided that maybe that wasn't a humane thing to do. Again, prisoners of war were kind of leading the way in this prison situation. And prisoners of war were given a standard military ration, but lower. So because they weren't working, people that were in charge of the prison figured that a prisoner of war could survive on maybe two thirds or half of what a regular soldier would get. In theory, they were supposed to get that ration every single day. Now, the reality is, is I don't think anybody ever got what the rules said they were going to get. Here are the rations set down by the state of Pennsylvania. And we have Sunday, one pound of bread, one pound of coarse meat made into a broth. Monday, one pound of bread, one quart of potatoes. Tuesday, one quart of Indian meal made into mush. And then Wednesday, we get the bread and the potatoes. Thursday, the cornmeal again into mush. Friday, we have bread and potatoes. Saturday, we have the Indian meal into mush. So just one day a week, you've got something with meat in it, and the rest of the time, it's just a simple bread and potatoes or cornmeal mush. We also have some documentation for New York in 1800. This is the food for 250 prisoners. For breakfast, a peck of rye, six and a half quarts of molasses, 130 pounds of Ryan Indian bread, and then the fuel for cooking it. They have that as part of their, their budget. For dinner or lunch, 17 ox hearts, seven ox heads, six lamb plucks, that would be like the, the guts, one peck of potatoes, three pounds of Indian meal, some salt, uh, a little bit of pepper, and then 110 pounds of bread, maybe that's soft bread or hard bread, and some herbs. So they'd probably make one big sort of stew out of that, again, for about 250 people. And then for supper at night, 36 pounds of Indian meal for mush, a little bit of salt, 61 pounds of bread, a little bit of molasses, that's it. It is painful to read many of these prison accounts. The prisoners at times were held in community basically all in one giant room. And they would be given their food ration or they would be given charitable clothing and they would gamble these things away. And then they would be left in the most destitute situations. If we take all that we've learned here today and put it all together, I think we can make a feast for our prisoner. Now, if we look at this 1800 New York description of what they're feeding their prisoners, they take very, very inexpensive meat. So ox hearts, ox heads, and they make a very thick broth. Now they could probably use any kind of inexpensive meat in the time period, maybe even a lobster. And we're just gonna take a standard meat broth for that with a little bit of beef in there. And mix that with potatoes, 
and then cornmeal and rye flour. And this will make a very, very thick and very inexpensive stew. That is probably the classic prisoner feast of 1800. So we're gonna start our stew with our potatoes. I've sliced them up into chunks. Don't worry about peeling them. I'm sure they didn't in the time period. We're gonna put those into our water and get them boiling so they start to get a little bit soft. I don't even know if they bothered with this step very much at all. They probably just chunked it all together and started to let it cook. But we're gonna let our potatoes soften up and then when they are soft, I'm gonna put in our broth. And it does have just a little bit of actual beef in the bottom of it in the time period. I mean, this might have been something as simple as pig's feet or whatever they had. After that's boiled a little bit and heated up, we can add the thickeners and we're gonna stir in a little bit of cornmeal and then we're gonna stir in a little bit of rye flour. And this will make it very, very thick and seem like an amazingly wonderful filling meal to any prisoner. No, we're not gonna add any nutmeg, but we will add a little bit of salt and pepper. This topic is both painful to research and to talk about. But if we wanna get something positive out of this, and we do, many, many people in this time period are looking for a better way. They want a more humane way or a more effective way of dealing with the people that are breaking the rules in society. Maybe it doesn't work. Maybe they didn't find the best solution, but they certainly were trying. This is the Poor Prisoner's Feast, and it is very good.